Hi guys, Buildzoid here, and today we're going to be taking a look at these three random looking curves. Um, basically, each of these curves represents uh, a sort of behavior that you'll encounter when overclocking that I think you should be aware of. This isn't super helpful, it's just kind of like, this This is neat to be, you know, to know about. So, let's take a look at the first curve. So the first curve is frequency versus voltage. It applies to basically everything. Um, you know, GPUs, CPUs, memory sticks. It's most obvious with memory sticks or when you're pushing things on uh, sub-zero cooling. Um, now, the reason why it's super ridiculously obvious on memory sticks is there's a lot of memory out there where once you pass a certain voltage level, the frequency starts, like, the maximum stable frequency starts deteriorating very, very quickly. Um, so that's when you, when you get into this part. Most people don't really, like, realize or encounter, um, well, most people might run into, say, this region, or even sometimes into the, this region at the end, um, which I call this, th this whole thing is like the rollover region, this is like where you start getting the voltage wall effect, where it's like, oh yeah, the next 100 megahertz needs, like, way more voltage than the previous 100 megahertz, but, um, the, the rollover part where the voltage actually starts falling off, um, well, the f stability starts falling off as the voltage keeps increasing, a lot of people don't realize when they hit that because the typical overclocking process is that, you know, your, your stock frequency might be somewhere here, and so you slowly work your way up this, this linear part, right, and, and you just raise the voltage 50 millivolts, raise the frequency 100, mi uh, 100 megahertz, you go up here, then you raise it another 50 millivolts, 100 megahertz, you get here, you know, and you just keep going up the curve, and at some point you're going to try to do something like that, and you're going to be like, oh, I need more voltage, so um, you, you just sort of, you know, go from, like, you try this point over here, find out that doesn't work, so then you end up here, um, th then you try over here, and it's like, eh, you know, and so th then you might accept that the frequency isn't getting better, and then, then somebody's going to try like there, and they're not actually going to go and test that this is the new stable frequency. They're just going to back off to the previous point. So you can run into this and not realize that you've run into it because it's just like, well, you just back off when, when you stop seeing scaling. Um, so, you know, th this is also why you see the, the sort of voltage frequency wall where it's just like if you keep raising the like. At some point, you get a like you say, like with a well with a lot of architectures, you'll get to a point where the next hundred megahertz needs a drastically larger increase in voltage than the previous hundred megahertz. So, um, you know, and that's like this part of the curve right here. Um, a lot of uh, so. What's kind of resp like the thing is I've really not thought this video through very well. It's just like it's it's been an idea in my head for like we should we should talk about the fact that these these are behaviors and overclocking that exist. At the same time, I've still not figured out how to put that into words that make any sense to the average human being. Uh, so <laughs> that's no good. Anyway, so for, yeah, so for memory sticks, you know, the, the, like, and, and memory chips, there's just going to, like, it depends on the memory kit, um, but there's always going to be a point where if you just keep raising the voltage, your stability is going to, like, you're going to be causing more problems than you're solving with the extra voltage. For CPUs and GPUs, you have the same thing, but, you know, most people, like, a lot with CPUs and GPUs, you tend to run out of uh, cooling or voltage headroom, where it's like the voltage you're at is just generally unsafe, so you wouldn't stay there anyway. Um... Now, the interesting thing with this is, is this curve is also, say, part of the reason why, say, NVIDIA GPUs don't, don't overclock very well with voltage, right? Like, especially modern NVIDIA cards, it's like, they ship with stock settings that are, like, right here. So if you significantly raise the voltage on, like, a Pascal or a Turing GPU, uh, you don't really see any major frequency increase because you're, you're just going that way. Um, and, and say hello to the fall, right? So... That's kind of the issue with, and that's actually going to be, become more and more of an issue with uh, really newer and newer architectures because the the main thing that's responsible for this effect is in silicon hots, like in chip hotspots, where basically as you raise the voltage, there's a part of the chip that gets disproportionately hot compared to the rest of the chip when you raise the voltage a small amount. And the thing is, um, your temperature sensors will generally not help you too much with identifying these hotspots. So you know if you look at a you know if you look at a chip, you know it might look something like this. And the whole issue is that your hotspot might occur over here, 
your temperature sensor is over here. So the temperature sensor, or, you know, it might be right in the center of the chip, or maybe on, like, the opposite edge of the chip, or somewhere, right? You, you'll have, like, one temperature readout, and it's not in the right spot. Um, or even if it's relatively close to the hotspot, it's not directly on top of it. So the problem with this is you'll have your hotspot, and the hotspot will be much, much hotter than the actual temperature sensor. So the, the temperature difference at the temperature sensor, you know, at, at lower voltage, you might be reading... 90, uh, well, okay, let's say 70 degrees, and at higher voltage, that might shift up to, say, 75 degrees, but the hot spot could be 20 degrees hotter, um, and that's why you lose, like, why why you start running into this whole region where it's like, oh, you, you increase the voltage, but the frequency doesn't improve so much, and then if you keep increasing the voltage, that hot spot can get so hot that it can start negatively affecting the maximum stability, like, maximum frequency that's stable of the chip, um, now, this effect is also, like, for GPUs and CPUs, I've mostly encountered it on liquid nitrogen, because there it's really obvious, because you generally, on liquid nitrogen, you're going to overclock until you hit a point where where the, uh, where basically more voltage doesn't help anymore, so, and, and the curve for that looks basically, it's actually going to be, well, it depends on the architecture, but it's going to look something more like this, where um, just across the entire frequency, like, first of all, at any given voltage, you're going to have more frequency. Now, I don't know exactly what happens in the low end because I've never bothered to check what happens at low voltages on liquid nitrogen. I normally start at like 1.5 volts um, or 1.4. Well, depends on the architecture, but I, I like to I like my voltages high um, when when you know going sub zero. So, not entirely sure what happens if you were pushing like less than stock or stock voltages, but. At higher voltages, you'll basically get a nice big uplift in the frequency. Then here, because the, the temperature of the hotspot is significantly lower, this non-linear, like the part where it stops being linear and starts rolling over, that just levels out into nice linear scaling. And then you get up to this point where eventually you have a, you know, peak frequency that's very stable. And normally the way you, re you, you can figure out that you're, you know, that you're trying to run, say, uh, these settings over here, um, instead of the the peak of your chip is if you've you know so you've worked your way up the curve and you get to this point uh, let's say that point is like 6.8 gigahertz at some arbitrary well let's say 1.8 volts right so th this will be like a kb like cpu um so you run your 6.8 volts uh, i mean 6.8 gigahertz 1.8 volts um and then you try say 1.85 volts um and 6.9 gigahertz and that crashes so then what you can do to figure out that now you're in the rollover like the yeah the rollover part is you can run 6.8 gigahertz at 1.85 volts and if it's still not stable you know you're you're pushing too much voltage at that point and it's like okay it's not going to scale any further unless you either get more cooling somehow which you're on liquid nitrogen that's not going to happen or you have to like like see if you can tweak your thermal paste application or like lapping the ihs or just anything to try get you know, better thermal transfer from the base of the LN2 pot to the actual chip. Because on LN2, the biggest problem is that, um, you know, if, if you look at your chip, your chip might be like, like that, and then you have your IHS on top of that, and then there's a layer of thermal paste on top of that, and then finally on top of that, we have our, you know, you, you have your LN2 pot, and uh, yeah, b big freaking chip we got here. And so you might have a hotspot that's like right here in the chip. Right, and your thermocouple is sitting probably around here somewhere in the LN2 pot. Um, and so you don't, like, you have no idea what's actually going on with the temperature of the chip. Um, you just kind of see the effect of the, the, the voltage on the frequency, and uh, that, that's kind of it. Because the, the temperature up here is actually because you're, like, there's so many, like, it, the distance is so far, and there's so many different materials in between the thermocouple and the actual um, hotspot on the chip, your thermocouple is not going to indicate the temperature of right here very, very accurately. Right? Like, the temperature difference between 1.8 volts and 1.85 volts, on especially, say, like a KB like quad-core CPU, is going to be, you know, maybe a degree at the thermocouple. Like, you're going to go from, say, minus 189 under load to minus 188 under load, which doesn't look like a big deal, but you can already be going into this part because this part of the chip is very, very hot, even though the thermocouple is still very, very cold. So, 
uh, yeah, anyway, so that, that's that's one of the curves that I wanted to talk about. Um, just your voltage versus frequency scaling. Um, it's also interesting to note that on some chips, the like the hard rollover occurs at voltages that are like significantly above what, what is safe to run long term. And I'm just going to grab black over there. All right. So there are certain architectures where they'll actually like this much voltage is too much voltage, um, as in you degradation, right? Um, but the chip scale, well, actually, no, they're so. This was mostly like larger nanometer scale processes. So like 32 nanometer and larger, you know, uh, manufacturing sizes. Uh, you'd have degradation at like this voltage right here, but the scaling is pretty good, you know, all the way up to say here, um, which is just like, like Sandy Bridge is a great example of that. Like those chips, even on water cooling, they will scale to very unsafe voltages, like ridiculously unsafe voltages. And they'll just scale and scale and scale. Now the last step, you know, is again, like it's very much not linear anymore and you need way more voltage than, than you'd really want to for, for the last couple megahertz. But um, yeah, there are architectures where the degradation point is just like way below the actual rollover. Um, and then there are other architectures where your degradation point is actually relatively close to the rollover. So yeah, but anyway, so that, that's one curve I wanted to talk about. The next one is power draw versus voltage. So that's our power. This is our voltage again. And this is supposed to be a parabola, but as you can probably tell, I'm not very good at drawing uh, parabolas. Um, also, you know, there is a below a certain voltage level, the chip literally doesn't work anymore. So that's that's why it just kind of ends right here instead of going all the way to, to zero because at zero volts, the chip literally won't, like it doesn't run. Um, and below a certain voltage, the chip won't run. So that's kind of that. Um, anyway, uh, when did I want to? So the point here is, is just like, yeah, if you increase your voltage by 10%, you know, so plus 10% volts, um, that leads to a plus 21% increase in power draw, um, which basically tells you that overclocking is always horrific if you're raising the voltage your overclock is always going to be horrifically inefficient there's just nothing you can really do about that overvolting causes terrible power efficiency because at any point in that curve a 10 percent increase in voltage translates to a 21 percent increase in power consumption now admittedly if you're you know going from 10 watts to 12 watts not really a big deal if you're going from 200 watts to 240 watts, which is the same percentage increase, 40 watts is a lot more difficult to cool than, you know, 2 watts, unless you're using, like, a MOSFET, <laughs> like, unless your heatsink's really pathetic. Um, and that's something to keep in, like, that's, you know, one thing to be aware of. Similarly, if you're undervolting, um, minus 10% uh, voltage leads to a minus 19% increase in, uh, decrease in power. Um, which is why undervolting, like, I, I'm surprised that it took people so long to notice that, like, undervolting chips massively improves power consumption, because it's like, well, of course it does. Like, you cut your power, you cut the voltage by 10%, you cut the, the, the current draw by 10%, you get a roughly 19% decrease in, in power consumption, right? Um, so that, that's kind of the, the, the thing, like, so basically... What this also means, if you want good performance per watt, um, run your chip down here, right? Like that, that's, that's how you get good performance per watt. It, it's not like there's no sweet spot on the power performance curve. It's just like if you can lower the voltage another 10% and you don't lose more, like, because here, like the thing is, if like this is, if you don't lose more frequency, then you lose power consumption and your performance per watt will always go up. Right, because performance per watt is basically a function of how much clock speed are you running at watt power consumption. And if you can reduce the power consumption by 20% without losing 20% of your clock speed, well, you're going to improve your efficiency. It doesn't matter that at some point, like if, if you know, a lot of chips, if you run them down here, well, they're, they're going to basically run like a slideshow instead of, you know, you won't be measuring your frame, uh, you won't be measuring frames per second, you'll be measuring how many seconds it takes to draw a frame but it'll be efficient, right? It'll be really efficient. So, 
anyway, but but this is another curve that I, I just think you, you should be aware of. And it's it's the main reason why, yeah, if, if you're overvolting anything, the efficiency gets really bad. And large amounts of overvoltage, like a 30% increase in voltage, translates to like a 70% increase in power consumption, which is which is just insane. But there are definitely architectures out there where, you know, if you increase your voltage by, uh, well, uh, you can't justify it because it's like, yeah, if you increase your voltage by 30% and you gain 30% frequency, right, you pick up 30% more frequency, which is like probably best case scenario for the voltage to frequency scaling. That that would be, you know, that, that would be going from like this point on the curve to that point on the curve, which is like, that's the good part. Um, and the voltage scaling doesn't tend to, like, voltage to frequency scaling doesn't tend to be one-to-one, -one, but I've not really bothered to, like, track that behavior in, in the past. Like, I do care about, like, power versus voltage relationships. I've found those very interesting. Um, the, the frequency, max stable frequency versus voltage is also, in my opinion, a very interesting uh, relationship. But voltage, like, well... The like this part of that relationship, I find very interesting. This part, the the linear region, couldn't care less. <laughs> it's just like I, I don't know how much. Like, so I don't know if like I don't think it's one to one. I'd be very surprised if it's one to one. But hey, if it is one to one, then even then, it's just like yeah, you increase your voltage by thirty percent, you pick up thirty percent more frequency. At best, you're getting thirty percent more performance, but your power consumption is going up by sixty nine percent. Yeah. Overclocking is never power efficient. Um, and anyway, so that kind of brings me to the last curve, which is frequency versus power consumption or power consumption versus frequency, which is basically linear. It's not quite one to one most of the time. In my testing, it's normally like one to 0.9. As in, if you increase frequency by 1%, you get about 0.9% increase in power consumption. Um, but this basically means that if you're underclocking and undervolting, your efficiency goes up very, very quickly. And if you're overclocking, your efficiency just falls off a cliff. Because in the previous example, like previously with the power versus voltage thing, I was like, yeah, 30% more voltage, 30% more frequency. But And if we ignore the fact that the frequency increases your power consumption, you'd still be up to like seven, like you'd be pulling now 70% more power just because of the voltage increase. Now factor in the frequency increase and it's just like, yeah, that's, that's, that's no good. Like, you know, if you raise the frequency and don't touch the voltage, you still get an increase in power consumption. If you also raise the voltage, well, it's not good. If you increase voltage by 10% and frequency by 10%, you get a roughly 30% increase in power consumption for at best a 10% increase in performance because performance is at best linear with your frequency increase, right? That's assuming there's no bottlenecks in the system and every clock cycle you, every new, like every clock cycle you add per to each second is actually being used. Um, if you add 10, like the, there there are certain situations where let's say you have a really bad memory bottleneck where you can add like 50% more clock cycles to the GPU or the CPU, but because there's no data actually getting from the memory to the chip fast enough, those 50 extra clock cycles you just added do a whole lot of nothing and you get 0% performance gain, but you do get some of the power, like the, also your power consumption doesn't go up as much because if the clock cycles aren't actually, you know, if, if there's no calculations being run, that's a bunch of unused logic just sort of sitting idle there waiting for data to turn up. So the power consumption isn't that bad if you're, uh, if you're horrifically memory bottlenecked, but at the same time, if you raise the voltage, it's just like, well, your efficiency is still going to be terrible just because of the voltage increase. Um, so yeah, the, these are kind of just, just behaviors that I think, you know, are like, the, they won't massively help you in, in overclocking. I just kind of find them interesting and something to, to keep in mind, uh, especially this curve, if you're doing memory overclocking, right? Don't just keep raising the voltage, expecting the voltage to always translate into better stability, because generally it doesn't. At some point, you're going to raise the voltage and the stability is going to get worse. Um, and memory is just the, like, because memory, like, on ambient, again, as like I gave you this example with the CPU, where it's just like, well, nobody actually tests the CPU. Like, mo most people will just back off once they get into this area, right? Um, but, uh, 
with memory, a lot of people will get into this area, and because memory doesn't get hot, right, memory doesn't produce a lot of heat, it's not very hard to cool, they'll be like, but my memory stick is still at just 40 degrees or whatever, which is a perfectly fine, you know, a perfectly good temperature. 40 degrees is a perfectly good temperature for a memory stick at, say, 1.5 volts. At 1.6 volts, not so much. But they'll be at 1.6 volts, 40 degrees, they'll be like, my temperatures are fine, why isn't it stable? And they'll raise the voltage and it'll be less stable because they're going to just go that way. And it's like, it's not going to get better. Like, you're here. <laughs> like, this is where your frequency fall off starts and you're going right past that. Um, and if you keep raising the voltage high enough, there's quite a few memory ICs out there which literally won't even train. Like, if you shove enough voltage into them, the motherboard will literally not be able to post. So, and it won't kill the memory chips. A lot of memory chips out there are capable of, like, tolerating very high voltages without suffering permanent damage. They'll just not be even remotely stable, um, which, which is kind of fun. So... Yeah, this is something to keep in mind, especially if you're messing with memory and, you know, going up there in terms of the vaults, both for DDR3 and DDR4. Um, this is just something to, like, you can give up on your overclock ever being power efficient, because if you raise, like, there's nothing you can do about that. You raise the voltage 10%, there goes 20%, there, up, up goes your power consumption, right? And you raise the frequency 10%, 10% more power consumption, so... Yeah, um, that, that's kind of that. So on, on the flip side, if you're undervolting, right, if you sacrifice 10% of your frequency to 10% of your voltage, then you're going to gain like a 30% increase in efficiency. Like your power consumption is going to go down 30%, but your, uh, but your clock speed goes down 10%. You're going to lose maybe 10% performance, but you're going to reduce power consumption by 30%. So undervolting always is going to just increase your, like, like, like there's no sweet spot is what I'm trying to get at. Like, there just isn't, because any at any point in this curve, 10% translates into a 21% increase in power consumption, right? Similarly, at any point in this line, because that's what it is, if you reduce the frequency by 10%, you get a roughly 10% decrease in power consumption. Like, well, it's not to like, except for the part where if you keep doing that for long enough, at some point you're going to have a slideshow. So, yeah, um... There, that's now actually it. Now I feel like I've actually said everything I wanted to say. Fun fact, I've had this idea for this video for like a year, maybe two, and I've just never really figured out how to put it into words. So hopefully the words I put it into here make some sense, and, and this, this was actually interesting and not really boring, because, yeah, it, it, like, I don't know. Um, Anyway, so yeah, that's it. Thanks for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comment section below. If you'd like to support what I do here with Actually Hardcore Overclocking, I do have a Patreon. There's a link to that down in the description below. And uh, if you don't like Patreon, there's also the AHO AHOC Teespring store where you can pick up shirts, stickers, posters, you know, the usual YouTuber merch stuff. Um, and both of those help out immensely with running the channel. So yeah, if you if you'd like to check out either the Patreon or the the Teespring store, that would be great. And yeah, that's it. Thanks for watching and goodbye.